Good morning, sir. It's Alok Singh. Our this session is has been streamed on Facebook, so we are going to live on Facebook also. Yeah, sure. So, okay, yes, sir. So, on behalf of Nirvan University Jaipur, I, Alok Kumar Singh, welcome all the dignitaries and especially our speaker, Dr. Deepeshwar Singh, our expert head, Dr. Charu Sharma, the team members of the Nirvan University Jaipur, and other delegates, participants of the today's session. Now, on behalf of Jaipur, I am handing over the mic to Professor Dr. Charu Sharma to start the program and proceed it in a step-by-step -step manner. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arup, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, all. It's hearty welcome to everyone. And thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Dr. Charu Sharma, Head of Department, Yoga at Nirvan University, Jaipur. Indian Institute of Material Management, Jaipur, and Nirvan University are the leading provider of this research webinar. Today, we are presenting webinar on quantitative approaches in social sciences, presented by Dr. Deepeshwar Singh, Associate Professor, Division of Yoga and Life Sciences at SPSR, Bangalore. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any query during the session or the presentation, please type them into the comment box in your Facebook, YouTube, go to webinar or WebEx in control panel. I will bring them up during the presentation and we will also have time for questions at the end. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our today's presenter, Dr. Deepeshwar Singh, sir. Dr. Deepeshwar Singh, Associate Professor, Division of Yoga and Life Sciences, SVSA Bangalore. Dr. Singh has more than 12 years of experience in the field of yoga and cognitive neuroscience. He has published more than 30 research papers on yoga and authored many books. He is an active member of Society for Neuroscience USA. He has presented research papers in international and national conferences and conducted several workshops on research methodology, scientific writing, applications of neuroimaging tools, techniques in yoga research. He has received Young Scientist Award from Science and Engineering Research Board, SERB, Government of India, to study Cerebral Autoregulation and Sympathetic Nervous System Activity, SNS. While performing cognitive tasks during yoga practices, which have different effects of SNS. Further, he has received several other major grants from Government of India to investigate the efficacy of yoga on human health and well being. Currently, he is exploring the effect of high-frequency yoga breathing kapalabhati on gamma oscillations in the brain and neural plasticity funded by the Department of Science and Technology. So we are having a huge dignitary and a effective personality in the research and yogic sciences. But before going ahead, I want to call our pro-president at Nirvan University and chairman at Indian Institute of Material Management, Jaipur, esteemed Professor Ravi Kumar Goyal, sir, to welcome Dr. Deepeshwar and to introduce about the webinar series in Biri. I want to tell some good information, and I will be very glad to tell these things about Goyal, sir. 
Dr. Goyal is a nurse of NIT Jaipur and actively working in the leadership role since last two decades. He is the President Institute Innovation Council and Honorary Education Chair, ASSOCHAM Regional Council for Green and Eco-Friendly Movement, Rajasthan. He has visited more than 10 countries, more than 110 research paper to his credit, authored 15 books, received more than 30 awards, and have several patents to his credit. So please enlighten us with your words. Dr. Ravi Kumar Goel, sir. Thank you, Dr. Charu. I hope I am audible. Yes, sir, definitely. Yeah. So good morning, everyone. First of all, on behalf of Indian Institute of Material Management Jaipur and Nirvan University Jaipur, I heartily welcome you all in this webinar on quantitative approaches in social sciences. I'm sure that all participants will be benefited from this. Indian Institute of Material Management Jaipur is having around 10,000 members and having headquarters at Nabi Mumbai. And it is representing a wide spectrum of professionals engaged in materials management, responsible for planning, sourcing, logistic, and supply chain management. And Nirvan University Jaipur is incorporated by Act Number no. 2 of 2017 of Government of Rajasthan. And it is running various certificate, uh, diploma, advanced diploma, UG, PG, and research programs according to new education policy. So I am Jaipur and Nirvan University Jaipur is having this webinar series on every Thursday. So once again, I welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for your blessings and for information you have provided us. And uh, now I want to request Dr. Tipeshwar Singh. Please go ahead with your presentation, sir. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Tipeshwar uh, Singh. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Chavi Sharma. Uh, Head of the Department of Yoga. For uh, I'm audible, right? Yeah. Thank you. So uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to share my knowledge on on quantitative analysis, uh, how it is uh, uh, good for social science research. And I'm very much thankful to Indian Institute of Material Science to uh, conduct such kind of that series, which is very much important for research students, basically those who would like to look at the career and the research in part of MSc and PhD programs. So I'm sure this web web webinar is going to be a very useful for them. And uh, thank you so much. Um, as as I, uh, Dr. Charu Sharma has mentioned, I'm working in uh, Swami Vivekananda Yoga Anusandana Samsthana, which is a yoga university deemed to be a yoga university. And uh, um, uh, this you know, university has contributed uh, a sufficient amount of uh, scientific evidences behind yoga practices. So we started our research journey in 1986 under the guidance of Dr. Nagratna. So she is now heading yoga therapy. She is the leading yoga therapy therapist in the world who published first international article in um, the British Medical Journal in 1986, which was an asthma. It was the first clinical paper in the world, which was uh, published by British Medical Journal in 1986. And after that, we have conducted so many web webinars, conferences, and uh, um, workshops on yoga therapy and yoga research. In the same line, today I'm going to talk about, as uh, um, Madam has mentioned, about uh, the quantitative approaches in social sciences. So as you know, yoga is one of the social science stream, which is going to be useful for, uh, uh, it is very much important to understand by the uh, students who are pursuing the PhD. So quantitative approach, with that, I'm going to start my presentation. As uh, uh, she has mentioned, I'm working in uh, Cognitive Neuroscience Lab. It is a part of Unvishna Research Laboratory, uh, where we do all kinds of neuroimaging studies. We are conducting a lot of molecular and biological, uh, uh, biological sciences studies. We are conducting uh, studies on uh, bioenergy, which is a new field, because our body is always emitting some kind of photons. So we are trying to capture those photonic energy and trying to a look at how this energy patterns give the information about the human health, which is a new novel approach. And um, another part of this uh, laboratory is to understand the sleep pattern, 
we are having a sleep lab we are able to understand how these yogis are having a limited amount of uh, sleep for example they are sleeping around 4 to 5 hours and they are very active whole day so there should be some kind of physiological changes are happening in them including the brain per uh, purview they are having the potentials to maintain their activity throughout the day having the sleep of 4 to 5 hours so there are so many changes are happening in their in the in the in the physiology and the changes in their biochemical uh, um, biochemical parameters so we have seen there are several changes are happening so how these changes are monitoring so when we talk about such kind of research we should know what is quantitative approach unless we don't have the information about the quantitative how to measure that because yoga practices which is written in the scripture as you allow all are aware about the patanjali yoga sutra or bhagavad gita they are given the theories they have they have they they are the literature which gives the principles but scientific approaches we are trying to understand by using scientific um, methods one of the method we are using in the lab is uh, electrical encephalogram or a functional near infrared spectroscopy fmri or transparent doppler sonography autonomic changes so many approaches we are trying to look at to understand these approaches we need to understand first quantitative approach quantitative what is this quantitative why it is called quantitative and to understand the qualitative so first i would like to tell about what is my content of this presentation first i am going to talk about a research method a small part where i am going to tell you about the four types of research and then i am going to talk about data and its type of data, research data then quantitative research characteristics of uh, quantitative research and then uh, about the quantitative research designs which is very much important for msc students and phd students which kind of design they should adopt and then again we are going to talk about methodology of quantitative research design and then advantage in data let's say that and then we can begin conclude so first we start with research method so once we should understand why we do need to do research research is something which is different from discovery or innovation people are getting confused research and discovery and innovation if you ask any msc student or phd student what is the difference between discovery and research they will come to know the differences um, uh, with the experience but at the initial stage they don't know the basic differences basically the discoveries are which is not a kind of a systematic manner they don't decide initially that they are going to do something and uh, they get something accidentally that's kind of uh, outcome comes under discovery but research is not like that research should have a systematic approach to understand to investigate any kind of phenomena any kind of theories using different kinds of uh, instrument tools different kinds of analysis different kinds different kinds of uh, study participants different kind of methodologies so we need a systematic manner a systematic inquiry is required for research research also needs some kind of planning unless we don't have a proper plan so so those planning i'm going to discuss today so once we know about okay research is something a systematic plan but what kind of systematic plan so based on the knowledge based on the uh, research idea we are making our research plan and basically the research is of two types as i told you about the systematic investigation systematic investigation should be two types one is called qualitative research other is called quantitative research since qualitative research is going to taken care by somebody else i am going to focus only on quantitative research so quantitative research when we talk about it is a research where we are gathering information or collecting information in terms of numbers facts okay so there are two other types of research also available those are called basic research and applied research so as i told you qualitative research something which is telling about the qualitative information about the facts about the uh, in um, any any uh, people about the uh, any kind of uh, ongoing process about the theories so such kind of when we evaluate by doing interview by doing survey those are comes under uh, qualitative research when i am looking at the quality information i am not i can i cannot convert that information um into numbers whereas quantitative information or quantitative research where we are 
taking the information in the terms of numbers or trying to convert in terms of numbers. For example, take a scale of visual analog scale, pain scale. I'm, I'm going to assess the pain. Okay, so pain can be described in the, num in the numbers like a very low pain, no pain, mild pain, moderate and severe. And we can give the number zero, one, two, three. So we are going to quantify the, uh, the assessment of pain. That comes under the quantitative research. Qualitative research, we generally keep interviews, which is sometimes a structured interview, or unstructured interview, which is a part of some other discussion, some other lecture. But quantitative research is having all these things where we are doing content analysis, we are doing historical research, we are doing ethnographic research, we are conducting experimental research, single subject research, correlational study, the different types of studies are including in the types of research. So other comes under this quantitative research is basic research and applied research. Basic research look at, looks at the a basic phenomena or theory or look at some kind of basic uh, conceptual exploration comes under basic research. Applied research comes after the basic research when we are having the information about what people have conducted, what, what the uh, facts we are available, available. For example, another example I'm going to give about how this yoga practices are effective in clinical conditions. Okay, for example, yoga for back pain. So there is a basic studies people have done that yoga practices improve muscular flexibility. It improves the strength of the muscles, right? So based on this concept, we know the symptoms of back pain, the rigidity, the spas spasmicity, and the, um, the stiffness of the muscles. Because of that, the pain started and we have observed that yoga improves this such kind of abilities. So we can implement this kind of research into applied research when I'm going to come in, put this yoga module for some kind of clinical condition that is also called theoretical, uh, therapeutic research and applied research. Therapy based research and when they're done, we are doing um, randomized control trial to understand the efficacy that comes from that applied research. And we are apl applying the outcome of that research into the hospital and different clinical therapy centers, rehabilitative centers, and different other places. So how this research needs to be conducted, first we need to understand. So once we decided, okay, I'm going to do a, um, a quantitative research, so we should know what quantity we need to inform, what information we need to drag, we need, we need to draw from the population. Again, we need to understand the, this information will be dragged in terms of the, either the verbal or non-verbal information. When I'm collecting information in terms of like using questionnaire, some kind of instrument I'm using, for example, heart rate, blood pressure, pulse rate, all these things when we being collect the information, we need to collect data, right? And we should know what is data. Data is a, a plural, plural, uh, uh, information when we collect information of number of uh, in, in numbers but when we collect only one data it's called datum datum is a singular and data is a plural some people are using data which is not correct we always make ourselves correct that data is not the correct word we should use data data is itself is a plural and datum is a singular so data is a collection of facts information and that information we are collecting in terms of numbers. As I told you about the pain scale, similarly, there is a scale called anxiety, mindfulness, okay? When we implemented such kind of questionnaire to, and to look at how much anxiety they are having, how much the mindfulness they are having, how, what is the quality of life of some kind of cancer patient, a back pain patient, or diabetic patient, we collect information in terms of numbers because those information in the terms of items and they are having some kind of responses, and each response is assigned with particular number. So that is called data. Again, the, the, the data is different different types. So, uh, so there are two types, mainly the um, qualitative type and quantitative type. As I told you, uh, this is the types of research data, and all research data in social sciences is divided into four different categories. First, this is called nominal data. Nominal data, like a when we are collecting information in terms of choice, yes or no, male or female, 
we cannot categorize them we cannot give them any kind of scoring we cannot give any kind of scoring whether that uh, male is better or female is uh, better we cannot give any scoring okay so the such kind of data comes in the nominal scale for example if somebody ask you which food do you like or which vegetables you do you like the most some people may like brinjal some maybe people like um uh, potato some people may like tomato different types of vegetables or some types of fruits when we are collecting information in terms of that it's not at all kind of uh, we cannot score them so that's called nominal data other data is called ordinal data which can be put in the order order for example as i told you about the pain scale mild moderate uh, severe and chronic or no pain so we can give them in order a ranking system when we use use this kind of any information when we collect in this way that's called ordinal data i'm not going to talk about these two data but i'm going to talk about discrete and continuous data where we are having um, uh, uh, it is also called interval and ratio scale interval scale is where some where it can be never zero now, for example the temperature if you look at in fahrenheit or converted in celsius it is a particular interval in between it cannot be changed if you look at the time 60 second is 1 minute it cannot be 1.2 minutes so it is having a particular scale it is a particular interval and it can never be zero whereas the ratio scale can be zero like our blood pressure data like our heart rate some yogis they showed zero uh, heart rate the blood pressure was completely zero it was no blood pressure lot of uh, yogis they have demonstrated in in front of the scientist that they could able to stop their heartbeat over a period of 7 days they could able to stop their heartbeat autonomic system was completely controlled over a period of one one hour so such kind of data comes under ratio scale okay so after understanding this data and datum or understanding about the which kind of uh, these are these are the questions comes very commonly asked in the interviews and the and the uh, um, examinations how many major major data how many bi biological scales are available so what is the nominal ordinal ratio and interval after understanding this then we can understand what quantitative information is so actually quantitative research is an inquiry into to identify the problem so uh, in quantitative data generally what we do we look at the information we look at the information uh, from the from the population desired population i'm going to look at data on back pain so i use some kind of uh, variables so again i'm using some particular term which is used generally by the researchers and maybe some people who may not have the background of research so variables are those which is going to be used in the study in the research and generally we are having three types of variables in the research one is called um, dependent variable dependent which is going to be manipulate which going to be change which going to be measured that's called dependent variable other is called independent variable independent variables are those which is going to be implemented for example drug administration any kind of intervention any kind of treatment we are implementing that is called independent which is under the control of the researcher then we are having a third is called confounding factor confounding variables which is unknowingly affect our research i can give you an example for example i am giving an example i am giving a, a treatment for back pain uh, so specific drugs uh, we uh, have been implemented but apart from the drugs and without telling information to the researcher the patient was taking some other may other treatment also might be ayurveda might be massage might be physiotherapy or might be yoga intervention and it was unknowingly by the research the changes comes uh, in the post assessment is not because of only the drug intervention it may be because of the all kinds of different treatments but researcher was unknowing and he claimed that the outcome is because of um uh, drug implementation administration but there are there are the two confounding factors also involved in that which was unknowingly and that affect the outcome measures so we have to keep always we have to keep our uh, visual, visualize our confounding factors try to keep away from the study then we can get the real information otherwise the information goes uh, uh, in wrong direction and we claim wrong facts 
Okay, so we have to be very careful. Therefore, we are having a criteria called inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. So whenever we plan any study, we should look at the what is our population. We look at what is the variables I'm going to measure, how we are going to measure, what is the procedure, and what are the confounding factors going to be used. What are the confounding factors our people are uh, in for, uh, giving us? What are the confounding factors are going to influence my study? So, some confounding factors we cannot control, like height. We cannot control age, gender. We cannot control them. So those confounding factors can be taken part no problem. But apart from that, if any confounding factors are happening in your study, try to control as much as possible. This is also called biasness. If I'm giving an, if I'm conducting a research on meditation and giving meditation in the crowded place, we cannot get a, we cannot expect good results because the meditation needs particular environment, a specific place, calm and keep in a uh, noise-free place where a person can go in deep meditation. If some kind of background noises are affecting to them, it is going to affect my outcome variables. So we have to keep in mind always this kind of uh, fundamental things while doing the research. It is also a phenomena by collecting the numerical information, as I told you. Uh, quantitative research is always conducted on the numbers. And to understand that number, we are having different methodologies, different ways to analyze the data, different ways to, and also there is a, um, in quantitative research, it is also very important, much, very important that to look at the samples. Sometimes we plan a study where we don't have the source of information, source of number, number of people are going to involve in my study. If I'm going to take up a, a study on cancer, and I don't have any information where I'm going to recruit the participants, then such kind of study should be avoided. We should look at in our surrounding, what kind of uh, samples we can get before planning the study. If we plan the study, get the uh, approval, and then we are looking hunting the subjects, it's going to be very difficult to, co to, to complete within the limited time because research is not like a uh, uh, timeless. It is having three, three factors are affecting our research. One is the time, which is which need research need to require three things: time, money, and efforts. If these three things you can put it in proper way, your research will be a wonderful and can uh, bring out a very tremendous changes. So, in quantitative research, you need to collect information from particular place. So, use yeah, so researcher need to use a specific sampling technique, like a random technique or non-random technique. There are probability sampling, non-probability sampling. I'm not going in detail again because I'm only talking about the quantitative research. So, uh, so, but we have to recruit the participants. And once we recruit the participants, we have to implement some kind of questionnaire. We have to take them into laboratory to look at their uh, objective assessment and subjective assessments. And then we do some kind of statistical and mathematical uh, analysis to conclude the results, to bring, uh, come out the results. Also, quantitative methods is very much important to look at the facts because some qualitative research cannot give me sometimes the real facts. They can evaluate, but quantitative research may gives me a real condition when we implemented what exactly happened in my population and what exactly uh, if I implemented yoga therapy for back pain, I should know how to implement in what condition I have to implement, what are the things we need to take care, how we can compare the results. If I'm having only one group, it's very difficult to generalize. We cannot generalize with using one group. So we should have a sufficient amount of information to categorize people into two groups. One group will get intervention. So such kind of planning you need to do in the uh, research, quantitative research. Quantitative met methods are always emphasizing on the measurements. Entire research, you do day and night, you collect the data, but after all, we are going to play our entire research with the numbers. If we don't have the numbers, we cannot conclude anything based on the just verbal information. We cannot give generalization to the population. You guys effective for the pain just by asking the questions to them. We have to look at assessment, subjective and objective assessments. If we ask, okay, how you are feeling today? How we are feeling tomorrow? Such kind of information may not be uh, qualified for the quantitative research. So quantitative research is always required some kind of numerical information. And later we play uh, this numerical data and we look at how much 
this change is happening because of my intervention. The, the, what is the goal now? So understood about the, uh, uh, we need to understand, look at this quantitative research. We need data, we need information in terms of numbers. Now, what is the goal? So primary goal of this quantitative research is to focus on more. Uh, 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 we have to look at the, uh, just one minute, look at the more focus on the counting and uh, classifying the features. Sometimes we classify based on the uh, information we receive the participant, whether they are from the mild group or moderate group or severe group. Sometimes this quantitative research is very much important to screen the population. I want to conduct a study on particular drug, how much that drug or some particular intervention, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, how much it is going to be effective for the students. And now which kind of student have to recruit in my participant in my study? We should quantify their um, uh, recruitment process. We need to look at uh, some kind of scoring method. We can use some kind of screening method like a MOCA, Montreal Cognitive Assessment Two. Everyone cannot be participating in my study because some people are very, um, um, very much um, intelligent to grasp any knowledge very fast. And some people are very low IQ level, which they cannot grasp very quickly. So we need to understand which kind of population we are going to try, put or recruit in our study. So when I'm giving some kind of cognitive behavior therapy, we should look at those who are below a moderate level, moderate score. So, so how we can get that moderate score? By implementing some kind of screening tool. So that is also part of quantitative or qualitative research. Once we know information, qualitative, or other qualitative information like our gender, pure research, we restrict it to male participants because a lot of physiological changes are happening uh, in females, including the uh, menstrual phases, which is affecting their mental state, effectiveness, uh, which, which affect their mood swing, which will affect their uh, quality of life. That is also affecting the quality of data. So we need, sometimes we restrict some studies when we are conducting study on brain research. We restrict it with the male participants because whenever we are collecting information, this kind of any mental changes or uh, mental uh, mood swing is affecting our outcome variables. So we restrict, otherwise we can include, but we have to look at, we have to look at during particular time, we should not collect their data. So such kind of studies comes under qual qualitative research. Once we go across that, then we come into quantitative. We call them in the laboratory, we measure their blood pressure, we measure their heartbeat, we measure their other parameters of, uh, of uh, physiological parameters or uh, biological parameters and then we look at uh, what are the changes happen in them after intervention. Qualitative research is very much recommended after qualitative. Once we know the demographic information about the participants, which kind of socioeconomic status they are belongs to, we can categorize them uh, poor uh, class, poor middle class, middle class or higher class and look at what are the uh, academic achievement they have got. So we can correlate with their socioeconomic status, with their education level, with their gender, with their age level, experience of meditation. These are quantitative information. Based on that, we can build a model. So this kind of research comes under qualitative research when we collect information about demography. But after demographic information, we expect we have to get some kind of information like a mindfulness. So the person is having 10 years of experience in meditation or some kind of yoga practices he practiced over a period of 30, uh, th three months, what are the changes that are happening in them? So level of examination, this level of practices, qualitative information, and based on that, I'm making a model, how, this, how much this influence their mindfulness, how much uh, this kind of uh, uh, practice effect is having their attention level, back pain level. So this information comes in the, so uh, quantitative research come in the late phase. That's why it's called late phase. Okay, because, because it provides a clear picture about whether my intervention if was worked or not. It is only measurable or numerical or information that can be converted into numerical data as I told you earlier, and uh, which we analyze, analyze by using uh, particular stat statistical methods. And the, that is called qualitative, quantitative research. When do we do research quantitative research? When we are trying to look at any theory and try to convert into a kind of application or to understand the basic phenomena. 
if there is a uh, there is a description given in the literature as we are working in the yoga field and literature is given that if uh, um, yoga karma su kaushalam if you do any work without any expectation your efficiency is keep on increasing your skills are keep on increasing you can check it and people are doing work without uh, the happiness we have done the one happiness scale and we measure when people are doing unexpectedly they have somebody what kind of happiness they got it and we observe when people do work with expectations the happiness was a little bit less compared to when people can do any kind of effort put any kind of efforts without expectation they feel much comfortable without having a backlog in their mind whether they will get the results or not if i have done my duties without expectations without any uh, other things the results of uh, mental behavior was better compared to when we are having expectations so such kind of qualitative information we converted to quantitative information and then we analyzed and come to the conclusion that and there is some more um, uh, scriptures based like sthiram sukham asana which is given in um, patanjali yoga sutra that when we are maintain any posture for longer duration it brings this stability in the mind and this study which conducted in our laboratory and we looked at the mental stability and physical stability and we observed after a particular duration of practice the mental stability was improved the physical stability was improved so such kind of information from qualitativity we start the concept was given in the literature we convert into numerical information and then we generalize if you do anything consistently over a period of this particular duration you will get such kind of changes in your mental level in your physical level so such kind of when we have a thirst in such kind of area then we can do a quantitative research uh, in yoga we are using when we are looking at the physiological changes following intervention social science in any social science when we are looking at the uh, effectiveness of drug or effectiveness of any practice or intervention i would like to look at how changes are happening in the uh, in the practitioners that time we have to conduct this quantitative research it is also when we are looking at the new phenomena unravel the mystery recently we have started a study on um, how people are transferring how group of meditators brains are connected to each other because when we practice together any kind of phenomena automatically our connectivity goes up goes uh, in, it improves like a mother and child how their brains are connected with each other if something happens in the to the child whether the child is nearby or distant mother comes to know or something will happen to mother child come to know there is a there are a lot of facts available uh, in our surrounding but when we are looking at the phenomena this is a concept is given somewhere but the phenomena when, when we are trying to explore we have observed there are the brains are connected when people are doing when they are closely associated with each other husband and wife sometimes wives understand husband and hand, husband and husband wives it depends okay now there is uh, uh, there are so much contradictory but their their brain minds are connected because they spend time spend together similarly we have done studies on group meditation and people do how their uh, brains are connected with each other if i give one kind of stimulus to one person how other person's brain actually gets influenced so such kind of um, phenomena which is defined in the literature we are trying to explore and this concept when i am trying to unravel the mystery that time this kind of research is very much required quantitative research qualitative information is not enough to generalize the information like if i ask you how your brain is functioning you will give me some theory you will uh, some uh, qualitative information will collect some kind of data but that is may not be uh, useful or implement to general population quantitative information is uh, about quantities um for uh, if i'm practicing or taking particular drug for particular duration how much this drug is effective for for uh, uh, for uh, uh, the treatment uh, for the patient how this drug is effective for the patient when we are talking about the effectiveness we should know what are how much doses we have to give or how much therapy we have to give or how much time we have to give for yoga therapy one hour of yoga therapy is good for back pain if particular if over a period of 3 months how we have to generalize after conducting a quantitative research with different designs i have given an example practice on meditation which uses uh, actually it is a, improves the mindfulness 
and it, it reduces anxiety. So sorry for typo error. Practice of meditation. If practice is going to be improved, if, uh, if you can convert into a number of hours or number of days, number of months, if I'm practicing and I'm look at how the mindfulness, I'm expecting the mindfulness goes up, improves the mindfulness and reducing the anxiety. So converted qualitative information into quantitative information. So now come to the uh, types, as I told you, uh, quantitative research design is a standard experimental uh, design where we are keeping all the designs in our mind and now I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, design. Uh, they are most commonly used by the scientists, particularly social scientists. Uh, in our laboratory, we are using uh, most of the experimental design where we are using two groups, three groups, or uh, uh, exper uh, experimental research design and non-experimental research design, which is again uh, classified into uh, true experimental design, quasi and experimental design. Uh, generally, uh, keep in mind, experimental design means where we are implementing some, some kind of uh, uh, intervention or drug and looking at and expecting some kind of change. Or we are looking at the looking at two different group of people, how their information correlate. Okay, like a, um, how this mindfulness and anxiety is looking at the correlation in meditators. Or meditators mindfulness compared with the normal healthy mindfulness, meditator anxiety compared with the um, uh, control group or normal healthy control group anxiety. When I'm looking at the difference between two groups, that's called correlational design, or uh, sorry, cross-sectional design. I'm looking at the two different groups of information. All these comes under experimental design. Generally, exper experimental design can be done uh, using a randomized method. And randomization, I'm sure uh, most of the PhDs might be knowing. When we are having e when we are recruiting the participants in our study. When each and every participant is having equal chance to be part of my study, that is called randomization or random sampling. If I am looking at some particular group of people to be part of my study, and I'm just looking at the choice or convenience, that type of study called is non-randomization or biased sampling. Please keep in mind random sampling and biased sampling. Some studies cannot be done randomization when you have a limited type of uh, samples or population if you want to work on some specific disease some specific conditions you cannot randomize them some very critical disease where the number of participants are very less you cannot randomize them where the population is big and the number of sources are more that time you can randomize into different sections but you cannot randomize before that you cannot randomize in a small section so Somewhere we are using convenient sampling, or sometimes we don't get participant in our study, so we are using snowball sampling. Or the snowball means referral sampling. We are giving to our friend that can you do you know somebody who is having cancer or somebody do you know who is having uh, ten years of experience in meditation? Because meditators getting is very difficult. People claim that they are practicing meditation thirty years, but when you look at their data, their data is not representative. So you get any good quality subjects. You know you are you you need to do a very rigorous sampling, and based on your sampling, your design will be decided, and based on this sampling and design, your outcome will be dependent because your outcome will be very difficult. And so, in true some experimental design, so in experimental design we have three different types, and in non-experimental we have four different types, and there are so many other types of design. Uh, since I'm talking only about the social science, so I'm restricted with you know, with the uh, this type of uh, design. So under experimental design, what we do, we uh, look at the facts around us. We come to the conclusion that we have to, this yoga is very much good or this kind of, this type of uh, drug is very much effective for some particular conditions. And we implement it, we look and we observe that outcome in different circumstances. And based on that, we conduct a research design. As I told you, effect of yoga, yoga improves muscular strength. Yoga improves back um, uh, a spinal flexibility. Based on those observations, I know that yoga could be a very good intervention for back pain, back pain condition. So based on the facts around me, I come to the conclusion and then I implement it to the particular task. If you look at the uh, picture three, 
I have decided my intervention that yoga I am going to include this many posture, this many uh, breathing practices and yoga and meditation, and it is going to be effective for the back pain. And then I am going to look at the this information with particular group of people of back pain, and I implemented and looked at and then I have looked at the outcome measures. I looked at how much data, how much information I gathered after implementing this intervention. And then we conclude that yoga is effective for that thing. Such kind of study design called experimental research design. And the experimental, so there are different ways. So you cannot just decide, okay, my yoga intervention is this and I'm going to implement. No, there's a particular method to implement that design. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about uh, true experimental design. True experimental design is basically a complete package where I'm having the information about uh, some particular process, as I told you, and researchers is completely having control over the control extermination or uh, conforming factors. As I told you, back pain. When I'm implementing yoga, particular yoga therapy to the back pain patient, I should request them during the intervention period, they should not go undergo for any kind of other practices. They should be restricted, follow each and every instructions or inclusion and exclusion criteria during the study. Based on that, we are going to recruit the participants. So otherwise, it's going to be very difficult. I have made a very good plan. I determined my theory. I made a, made a research question. I have a very good variables. I have a very good hypothesis. I have a very good experimental design, but your subjects are not listening to you. What is going to happen? It is going to create a problem for you because they will not listen to you. They will do whatever they want. So true experimental research design is not that kind of research design. Here, participants are going to be included based on the inclusion and exclu exclusion criteria. And we are going to take up variables. So we divide into two groups. One is called experimental group. Other is called control group. Don't keep only one group. Sometimes we are keeping one group. That is another type of design. That is another type of design when we are having only one group. Okay, I will. I am having not ten back pain patient. Let me uh, put some kind of drug or some kind of uh, yoga therapy, and I'll look at how much changes are happening. But you cannot claim that time when you have only one group that it is that your yoga intervention or drug administration is effective for the back pain because maybe other factors also influence the same uh, back pain. So unless you don't have a controlled condition. We cannot conclude any kind of changes which is happening in the yoga group or experimental group. Therefore, it is called experimental research design, which include the determinant of theory. We have a basis. We have a we should decide what kind of variables I'm going to use, what kind of samples I'm going to take, what kind of we have to decide the hypothesis, which is a tentative or assumption we have to create, which is of alternate hypothesis or null hypothesis. We have to create. Then we have to design the experiment, which is a framework. Of the study, then we have to look at the sample selection. What are the samples? Source of samples, and we have to decide how we are going to split to the samples in my study. Then, in, uh, looking at the uh, assessment tools, then look at their intervention, then analyze the result and conclusion. These are the part of experimental research design. This is the method which you need to follow when we are doing ex true experimental research design. Okay, where extraneous variables are limited, using the random technique. To include the participants using particular variables which is associated with the sample. So there are two sampling, there's different types of two sampling, as I told you, two exper experimental research design is having uh, different five different designs. One is called pre-post only control design, means post testing. Um, it is one type of also called um, cross uh, cross-sectional study. Post, uh, cross sectional studies, it is also called cross sectional study, where the participants are having some type of experience. As I told you, I'm going to look at how these meditators are different from the non meditators. Okay, so meditators are having around 15 years of experience, 20 years of experience in a uh, particular type of meditation. And I'm going to look at their mindfulness, I'm going to look at their quality of life, I'm going to look at their attention level. I'm going to look at their different kinds of different parameters. I'm going to look at how their parameters are different from the non meditator group. Such kind of, it's only one time assessment. That is also called post test. 
only controlled group where we have two different group and one time assessment that is called post test after some particular duration or yoga people how this yoga if uh, if you look at how this yoga practitioners those who are bsc msc students how their um, uh, level of mindfulness the level of attention level of anxiety level of depression level of mental attitude level of mental fluctuation emotional regulation how they are different from the other courses so only one time assessment we don't do, we don't need a previous data for them because i'm looking at how they are different from each other i'm not looking at how much changes happen because of yoga intervention okay when i'm not looking at the change i'm looking at the difference that then i'm going to look at this post test only control group design second is called pre test and post test control design which is also called sometimes randomized controlled design randomized control design because you have to collect people randomly i think i have made the figure yes so post test design as i told you you have randomly taken the people in the group and then we have divided into two different experimental control group as i know my teachers are uh, i have found from uh, any kind of monastery like a buddhist monastery i went i collected data and then i went to the one one uh, uh, other place normally the people have got from data from there and i looked at the changes okay at that time i have looked at the changes and the study is called when we are looking at uh, 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 as i told you students who are going for some kind of intervention i have taken their i have given some kind of intervention like a yoga yoga and i have not taken the pre data the student join in the first semester of bsc yoga therapy course and the student join in the bsc in other life science course i'm going to compare after 3 years of intervention after 3 years of practice of yoga how their their behavior is different how they are different in their attitude but i don't have the pre data i am only comparing their post data that kind of study called post test only control so i'm looking at the difference between two different different academic uh, groups or uh, different programs pre post as i told you randomly we have taken two different groups and we have collected the pre data by implementing some kind of variables as i told you we have to use dependent variables and then we have given some kind of independent uh, variable that is called treatment or intervention whether whether it is a drug or yoga intervention and look at the post changes that is called pre post test design and if we are using random technique to select the participants that's called random control uh, randomized control trial if you are not using random technique it is called biased or non probability or a non randomized control trial okay we have to be very clear careful when we are doing randomized control trial because a lot of limitations are there in randomized control trial and there are so much advantages in the randomized control trial okay because it's a very wonderful it's a gold standard design when you are you when you are taking participants randomly in your group is going to be a wonderful because everyone got equal chance when sometimes we start with the randomized control trial but we change over a period of time because of drop out is more sometimes some people want some kind of drug they don't want to go for yoga therapy that time it is really difficult to conduct this randomized control trial so such kind of limit, there are some several limitations now go for the solomon four groups design where we are generally using for different condition two different intervention i'm looking at for example yoga and ayurveda and both are having respective control group condition i'm looking at yoga effectiveness to the having the uh, control group in the yoga courses and look at the ayurveda intervention and we are having the control so that time two different interventions we have provided and we look at the interdependency the changes are happening within the group between the groups between the conditions so here here it comes to the different factors we are using it okay so here are here we are having two different factors two different groups two different interventions and then we are correlating their intervention with each other using repeated measures or some other methods now we are having different another called uh, factorial design factorial design when we are having one common factor and looking at their sub conditions for example like anxiety whether whether it is a mild moderate or severe when we are having different levels of measurement on different age groups that time we are we are, we are using factorial research design when we are having more than two dependent and independent factors variables okay when we are having more than two dependent and independent factors to make to look at i'm looking at the how much the 
an anxiety level in young, middle, and old people. How much anxiety means, means moderate or severe or mild when I'm having different levels of things I'm measuring on different age group. That time it is called factorial design. Now, randomized block design, which is another part of very important part of um, experimental, true experimental research design, where we are having different types of intervention. Uh, here I can say I'm giving um, uh, intervention of one is called right nostril breathing, left nostril breathing, alternate nostril yoga breathing. So it is also called Surya Anulom Vilom, Chandra Anulom Vilom, and Anulom Vilom, Nari Shuddhi. How these type of interventions are affecting different kinds of patients. So one group is having patients with primary hypertension. Other group is having diabetic patient with hypertension. Third group is having a renal patient with hypertension. How the same inter different interventions are correlated with different kinds of patients. So there are so many, so here everything is in block design. Every block A is having the first uh, group. A is having the second group. A is having the third group. Then B is having its first group. So these are the group when we are blocking them in particular. Intervention is same. In, if you look at the graph, A, B, C is getting some kind of intervention. But here, this kind of design only possible when you are having a very big group of people. If you have a small group, you cannot conduct such kind of design. When you are having a, like a thousand people around, you want to conduct a study on uh, effectiveness of yoga in yoga in your university, then it can be possible. Effectiveness of yoga and yoga therapy in the particular center, rehabilitation center, if such kind of design is not possible. Because rehabilitation center, those who are yoga lovers, yoga seekers who look at the treatment of, of yoga are limited. So you cannot randomize, you cannot keep them in this kind of uh, design. It's very difficult to convince like renal patients with hypertension, very difficult to convince only to take yoga intervention. They will take yoga intervention along with the medications. So such kind of designs are limitation, but yeah, it's a one of the wonderful, wonderful design. Uh, this is one of the another good design, which is called crossover design. Uh, this design is mainly useful when we are looking at two different medications are how they are effective. So one group we have started yoga intervention, and other group is having control intervention. After their post data, we are going to cross them into two different condition again. So B will get the same first intervention. And he will go for the experimental group condition, and the experimental group will go for the control condition. After going for the washout period, washout period is very important. Why? Because the carryover effect is going to influence your post outcome. Carryover effect is going to affect your data very much if you are going to look at this uh, crossover design. Crossover design, you have collected pre data, post data, and after you are going to change your intervention. So that time you need to wait for the um, we wait for the uh, washout period. Now come come to the non-randomized. As I told you, there are so many uh, studies are available where people are using non-randomization process, convenient sampling. Okay, where people are less, or sometimes the source of subjects are not very much helpful. That time we are using quasi-experimental research design. This kind of design is good when we are conducting uh, uh, a study in any rehabilitative center or in hospital. That time doing this uh, this kind of randomization is very, very difficult. Okay, so I'm going to uh, give you a gist, gist of this. When you are doing, this is the same kind of uh, randomized control trial. But here, again, we are having two groups, but we are not randomizing them. And we are taking their data in different time points. If I'm doing very longitudinal study, like a three years of period of intervention, so there are so many dropouts maybe there. So when we are looking at data in time series, that time also non-randomization process is very, very good. It is a fluctuation we like. So non-randomization process is very, very good. Okay, because you don't have the much uh, number of participants. Uh, other are like a one single case study. If I'm, I'm, I'm doing any kind of study on uh, some critical patients, it's very difficult to get the uh, large number of population. So I cannot randomize them. Or I'm going to one rehabilitative center or in hospital and uh, trying to wait for the patient. Uh, and uh, sometimes, so that time you may go for non-random process and whoever is coming to, to the hospital, you are taking them as a participant, conveniently, that is called convenience sample. Or sometimes you are collecting data only on one subject, 
one very critical patient came to the hospital we have given your intervention and look at uh, some how the outcome variables have changed here in our, in our institute a lot of patients comes with on wheelchair they come on a lot of uh, different chronic patients we get in our arogya dhama we are having a residential hospital in the asvyasa where people are coming from all over the world and every uh, week on thursday friday we are recruiting the patients in the arogya dhama for one week and they stay here in the in the campus and they start their yoga practice along with their conventional medicine continuously and sometimes we observe some specific disease cases this the changes are happening happening remarkable they come on wheelchair they go back to home on their feet so such kind of changes we have seen in after following your intervention in arogya dhama and asvyasa so such kind of population when we are studying that's called under pre experimental research design which is non randomized convenient sampling no control group is required only one patient study we can do the study on one patient also we can do we don't need a large number of population here so based on this i think uh, uh, there are so many uh, possibilities to conduct uh, research on uh, uh, non random random process and random process true experimental research design and pre experimental research design and both places quantitative research is very very important why because you need to collect information in terms of quantity so if i've seen the c uh, c reactive protein was reduced following yoga intervention if i have seen the pain is a scale was improved the pain was level was reduced the quality of life was improved all these things you we need to look at quantitatively then only we can generalize to the uh, common population with this i'm just uh, thank you for uh, inviting me and i'm sure i've given you a very gist about the studies i'm not not go uh, went into in, into the very deep discussion but yeah i have given a brief introduction about to our researchers who are who want to come for phd who are learning in msc it may be useful for them thank you so much and thank you for inviting me thank you ma'am thank you sir thank you very much it was awesome description and truly very informative having the idea about what is research actually types of data nominal and the ordinal ratio and the interval data um variables classification of quantitative research designs and the various types of research design in such a limited time thank you very much sir you, and sir. Uh, i'm really sure that uh, it would be very helpful for the research lovers and the scholars even after this webinar throughout the uh, recording version now we will go ahead and take some time for the questions just a reminder please be sure to type your questions or the queries into the question box in your control panel uh it seems we have a question here uh by ravi pratap singh so there is a question when are both quantitative and qualitative methods are beneficial okay when we decide qualitative when we are looking at this looking at the phenomena look you gathering the information if i don't have the information for example I, I, see research can be explained only with examples and there are so many examples we need to give in this so when i am looking at the quality information um, uh, about the participants when we don't know in, anything about the participants anything about the participants for example the social economic status i don't know about the participants whether which category they belongs to which what is their lifestyle pattern which kind of lifestyle they are using which kind of diet pattern they are using such kind of information when we are looking at and we are focusing on how this vegetarian food is good for the health or what is how the non vegetarian food is good for the health such kind of studies can be put into qualitative information or qualitative research but but still you cannot generalize that the uh, uh, vegetarian diet is good for the health or not unless you don't major unless we don't major that using some kind of quantitative method so we have to look at there are different parameters like a anger scale agitation scale quality of life scale so we are trying to look at the quality information and trying to look at their behavior when i am assessing their behavior using this kind of scale that it become a quantitative research so whenever you don't have the information about the population 
you have to go for qualitative data otherwise you can go for the quantitative data once you have a, enough information about your research then go for the quantitative study. thank you sir thank you very much i think there there is one more question that uh, can we use these both methods uh, simultaneously which both methods yes qualitative and the quantitative methods simultaneously can be used yes it is most of the studies it is going simultaneously uh, uh, i was discussing one of the PhD student so she would like to work on um, how this yoga therapy is good for lycoria phase right now we don't have any evidence about this so what i suggested her why don't you develop a yoga module based on the evidences which are happening this type of research is called qualitative research when, when i'm gathering the information so develop the yoga module go for the expert suggestion that's called validation so development validation and then go check and check the feasibility such kind of a study is called qualitative is having qualitative and quantitative both so looking at the facts correcting the facts getting the expert advice and then implementing implementing to the population that type of so development validation development validation and feasibility check checking that type of research is having both kind of design qualitative and quantitative okay thank you sir and uh... Please, uh, can we wait for one minute? Means so we are taking some questions if there are. Please. We request you all, please, if you are having any query, please type in the comment box. No, I didn't get it, please. No, uh, no, sir. I think there is no queries now. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so, so much. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. And uh, we appreciate you all being here and we are trying to collaborate with many experts for many fruitful topics related to the research and the various subjects through a webinar. And uh, thanks again for joining us today. We are seeing, Mr. we are uh, really wishing to see you next time. With this, honorable dignitaries, our dear and motivational personality, Dr. Ravi Kumar Goyal, sir, respected Dr. Deepishwa, sir, our most valuable invited guest. It is my privilege to offer you thanks on this occasion. Thank you, Dipeshwa, sir, once again, that you have given such a lovely description on this topic. I, Dr. Charu Sharma, on behalf of Nirvan University and Indian Institute of Material Management, Jaipur, and the entire supporting team on this uh, webinar uh, purpose and the webinar series, and on my own behalf, extend a very heartly word of thanks to the speaker for gracing our important work and sharing with us your findings and the opinion today. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Namaste, sir. Over to Alok, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am, for organizing uh, this wonderful webinar. I, on behalf of Niran, Nirvan University, Jaipur, my again giving my heartiest thanks to our speaker, Dr. Tepeshwar Singh, for spending this valuable time. Thank you so much, sir. We will definitely wish to have see you again in future with some burning issues and some uh, solutions to the realistic problems supporting to the research scholars. Thank you once again on behalf of Nirvan. Thank you, ma'am.